All right. So today we're going to talk about estimation, um, which we started to talk about last time. Um, so uh, I kind of want to like kind of start here. Um, so what we want to do is understand the error of our estimate, right? So we want to do so. Basically, we have kind of like this known piece of information in the world, right? So let's say it's that median salary we were looking for. But what we want to do is try to figure out, you know, can we find out what that number is or approximation of that number without actually getting a full, complete census of the entire population of people who make money? Uh, and so, how do we go about that? Well, so we can take those samples and we'll take more random samples. We're going to talk about a new, another technique for when we don't have a great uh, set of data about that particular uh, population or census. Um, and we'll get to that in a bit, but to kind of get started, we'll start with here. All right. And this is basically just the setup from the last time. Uh, so you can, you know, you should have notes about that from the last lecture. Um, but basically what we're going to do is take a look at what is that population distribution. Okay. So this, in this case, right, we actually have the data. So we know what the right answer is okay however obviously what we're going to do is, is pretend like we don't uh so that we can kind of see how you do it in a real world scenario okay. all right so just switch windows all right so let's say we only have 300 of those salaries okay and so um First, the first step here is let's take out those 300. So what, what's the best way to kind of get a set of data from the population that we have? And what, what method might I use to get a kind of a random set out of that set of, uh, of that population? Using sample, yeah. So we're gonna say a sample, and then we're gonna say we want 300 of those, oops, 300 of those, and we're gonna say, um, uh, without replacements, okay? Because we want, you know, unique data. And don't forget, right now, all we're doing is uh, to try to generate our kind of fictitious stamp sample as if we had stood on, you know, in front of a grocery store and asked people salary. So actually, in this case, it's all, if, you know, first we ask them if they're a city employee, then we ask them their salary. All right? So the first thing we might take a look at is the sample median. And what we're going to compare that to is our known population median. So basically, how close are we to the real answer is what pop median is. So pop median is the real median of the data set that we have. Um, so, but for this exercise, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, what's the median of that sample that we took? Okay. And so we just kind of take that 50th percentile and we see that it's actually 99,000. So it's nearby. Right, but because of chance, we don't, it's not going to be exact. So we can also then put it into a histogram so that we can kind of see what that data set looks like. Blow it up. Um, and so we by way of comparison, so this is our real one, right? This is what our, our distribution looks like. Um, so it's like 50,000 to you know, well, let's say. Most of the salaries are below 150,000, and then we have some kind of outliers above it. Um, and then in our sample, you know, it kind of looks pretty close to the same, right? So it's not too far off, but that's kind of the idea. So we went out and we actually gathered 300 samples because we didn't have access to the actual census, the actual population data. So what we're going to do next, right, is instead of kind of relying on that one simple sample, we're now going to actually take our sample and kind of turn it into more samples, okay? By using essentially randomness. So, <laughs> I got ahead of myself. <laughs> 
Okay, my bad. Uh, so we're actually, this is a, a, taken from the perspective of we do have full sample and we want to generate what that median is, but for whatever reason we can't calculate it. So we're actually going to pull samples from the full data set. Uh, the thing that we're actually talking about today is, is the thing I'm alluding to, which is bootstrapping. So apologies, I got ahead of myself. Um, so what we're going to do is just pull a sample out of this population and we're going to say sample again, but obviously what we're trying to do is we're trying to control for that error. What do I call it? Sample size. Um, that is introduced by randomness. Not that looks wrong. Okay, and then we're going to return uh, basically the, the median, right? So we're going to say percentile 50 hour sample dot column. Earnings. So, in fact, we've done this already a few times. So, we made a little function that will get us one sample median. Then we're going to say, okay, let's go and generate another sample median just to test it using a sample size of 300. So, just like the first one we did, except what we're hoping is that we're going to, if we do enough of them, right, we're going to get closer to the population median. So, as you can see here, if we do kind of just the straight subtraction, we can see what's our error. Okay, so our error is about 645, which is pretty close. If you think about it, right? We're talking about $100,000, $645 difference is, is not actually all that much. Uh, so that's pretty good. But, you know, we know there's random chance going into this because we're just pulling those samples. So now we just kind of do what we've been doing a little bit. And let's do it a bunch of times. And in this case, I was doing it with a thousand. Well, I don't know if that is too much. And so I just do new median equal to generate sample. Three hundred, and then I'm just going to add that into my list of medians. I'm going to say MQ and uh, sample means okay. So now I have that for loop, and then we're just going to basically call it. Uh, by using that print statement. One thing I'll point out, which I don't think I've actually kind of commented on before, if you're using print, if you just kind of put commas in there, it'll actually display all of them separated by uh, some space. So you can kind of just kind of shove it all into one line if you wanted to be able to compare things against each other. So what we can see is that our minimum is about 83,000, uh, our maximum is 108,000. Sorry, and then uh, the median of medians is 96,000. So that just kind of gives us an idea of what's our range look like uh, for when we took all those samples. But now what we really want to do is look at it on a histogram and kind of compare it to our population needs. So we know, right, so we actually know, and that's what that red dot is, where the real one is. So we're just kind of seeing how well this functionality works. And so what we're doing is, in, let's say that data set was, you know, a hundred million, several hundred million lines of salary data. Okay, we don't really want to try to calculate the median off of that. So instead, what we can do is we can pull a sample out, right? Calculate the median on the smaller sample. So if we were actually doing several hundred million, we probably want to do a bigger number than three hundred in our sample size. But the idea is the same: is that instead of using the however many records we have, we're going to use a smaller set. We're going to take a median of that because we can calculate that in a reasonable amount of time. But then we're going to do it a bunch of times. And theoretically, doing the 300 a thousand times is less work than doing the median of the actual data set. Does that make sense? Right? Because we're continuously basically trying to make whatever we're working on simpler. So that's what a lot of the techniques we use are is to try to how can we make this computationally faster? Right. And so this is one of those techniques where we have a data set that we think is pretty reflective of the overall data set, 
So we don't necessarily know that it's complete, but it's close. Okay, it's like it's in the neighborhood. So we can use this technique when we, when we have a pretty good idea of what the content is, and then pull a sample out of that, do that a bunch of times, and we're probably going to get pretty close to the median. And as you can see, we are pretty close, right? Right? And so, but to be more exact about it, we can actually pull out the errors. Where I forget, let me make sure my screen doesn't work. Okay, and so to do that, we can just subtract the two um, arrays from each other. Or sorry, the one array from the uh, actual population median, um, just to kind of see how we're doing. So now we have a set of errors. Um, and so we have the minimum error is about 12, negative 12,000, and maximum error is, is 11,000. <laughs> However, if you think about what, when we're talking about error, it's actually not quite right because what we really care about is the like the 12,000 is the biggest error right it just happens to be negative that makes sense this is one of those examples of we don't actually care about the distance we care about the magnitude or sorry we don't care about the direction we care about the distance or magnitude um so we can throw that into a table And for some reason, I recalculated it in my notes, but right? so we can just say sample errors. Um, and so, as you can see, right now, we're kind of probably pretty close, right? Because now instead of actually looking at the distribution of the data or whatever, which at the end of the day, that's not really what we care about. What we care about is the errors, right? We care about how far away we are. So we can eyeball it and see that the population median was kind of in the center of the graph. But this kind of more clearly shows, hey, are almost, you know, both the volume of the errors were actually at zero, right? So that's where we want to be, right? And then they channel off, obviously. All right, so now to not be ahead of myself, if I thought bootstrapping. All right, so I had to look this up. I don't know if anybody else does. I didn't actually know what a bootstrap was, but it's that little taggy thing that's on the back of the shoe sometimes uh, that helps pull the shoe up. That's what an actual bootstrap is. Uh, who here has heard the term bootstrap before? And how often have you heard it in reference to actual shoes? Like never, right? Um, so that's what an actual bootstrap is. Uh, what is really interesting about this phrase is pulling oneself up by the bootstraps uh, actually traditionally meant something that was impossible. And now there's a, a certain amount of like kind of political positioning where it's like, this is something you should be able to do if you were tough. Okay. So it's kind of interesting how the term has changed. And yet pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is literally impossible. Right, so it's, it's like right there in the word, but it has come to mean something that if you were tough enough, you could do it. Which I just, I think it's interesting. Word, the words are uh, very interesting. Um, so a tech, this is a technique for simulating repeated random sampling. Um, how many people here have done like programming classes or whatever in the past? Okay, so uh, does anybody here know what the, the bootstrap is on a computer? And bootstrap base. Okay, so um, the reason I bring this up is because if you do have a technical background at all, bootstrapping is used a lot, uh, and it kind of usually means the same kind of thing. Um, but basically, it's like if you're starting with nothing or near nothing, you know, and then you want to get somewhere. So on my laptop, for example, the bootstrap phase is when the power comes on, right, and code starts to run. To make it so that the keyboard works and the monitor works and all that other stuff works. And that's the bootstrap phase. It's when the one that computers start. Um, in this case, what we mean is we're going to take our, our not great sample and we're going to bootstrap it into turning it into something more usable. Okay. So that's where we get the term from. Um, and like I said, you will see this term throughout computing. Uh, so just be aware it does almost always mean the same kind of thing, but it can mean, you know, in the specific case, it means quite differently. Uh, so what we do is we say, okay, we have this original sample, um, and we think 
that the original sample resembles the population, but we can pull that uh, sample from that sample. We can we can now generate samples off of it. Um, however, we have to do it slightly differently than we were doing before. So basically, here's the scenario, right? Is that we have some unknown population, okay? So we, we went out and we stood in front of City Hall and asked people what their salaries were, but we don't know how like how good a job we did. Okay. But we we assume that it is not the complete population. So what we do is now we have a sample. Okay. And so if we actually have the population, okay, this is what we do. We sample without replacement, um, and we just we you know, resample. So we sample over and over again. That's what I just showed you. Um, and we and we could get to you know calculate our median, right? Or whatever other thing we're trying to calculate. But this is what we wish we had, but we don't think we do. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this technique, which is the sample with replacement on that sample that we think is not terrible, but also incomplete. Okay. I don't know if you can be any warmer in here today. Um, and so, and basically the red part at the bottom is the important part, right? We hope these two things are analogous. Um, we can, uh, there is actually math where we can show how, how analogous they are, uh, but we're not going to use that in this class. But here's kind of the, the long form version of the progress slide. All right, so the bootstrap principle, bootstrap world sampling versus is roughly equal to real world sampling. Um, so that double tilde, I don't know how well you can see it, but uh, you know, like a weighty equal sign means roughly equal, okay? Um, and, but it's not always true, but reasonable if the sample, if your original sample is large enough, um, and we hope that the variability of the bootstrap estimate and the distribution of bootstrap errors are similar to what they are in the real world, okay? Um, and so here's kind of how we do it. Okay. So what we do is from the original sample, we draw at random with replacement as many values as the original sample contain. Um, and the size of the new sample has to be the same as the original one so that the two estimates are comparable. Okay. And this goes back to the, the math and the, like proof of this, where when you're doing the resampling, they have to be the same size as the original sample. Otherwise you're going to introduce like error that is difficult to detect. Then we're just going to do an example. <laughs> All right. And so so we had our sample from before. And so we're going to use that as if it was our real sample. Now you see why the name is going to make me get ahead of myself. But I need to do one that is the same size. And this time, though, I'm going to do with replacement equals true. Um, All right. And so this is kind of one of our sample, like one of our bootstrap samples. Okay. And it kind of looks similar to the other ones, right? Except in this particular case, right? I could run this again, I'll get a different graph. Looks like we had more of those outliers kind of got pulled in, uh, maybe more so than we expected. But that's why we now need to turn that into a function so that we can do it a bunch of times. Oops. All right. So the first time I wrote it, um, I kind of wrote it out. Um, but this time I'm going to use the defaults. So sample by default will be uh, with replacement and the size of your initial sample or your initial data set. So I can just use the defaults from here on. And then we're just going to return that median because that's what we're ultimately trying to measure. Oh, here. Oops. 
Cristo. Okay, so now I have a function that does basically exactly the same as the prior thing, except, uh, you know, that way we can call it more than once. So now we just do essentially our for loop like we were doing before, except in this case, I, oh, I still use the thousand. All right, so I just write another for loop. I will not forget the colon that I always forget. Collect it. Then we're just going to collect it here and then we're going to display it in the next column. So that's going to take a little bit of time to run. It's already done. Uh, let's see if we know what things have to fix. Um, and so now we can see that our bootstrap median is the blue dot. Sorry, that's actually one sample median. Um, so that's one sample median, and then the red dot is the correct answer. Um, so, you know, we didn't do that great. This time, so probably what that means is maybe we didn't do a great job either. Uh, we didn't do a great job on our um, sample size, uh, you know, so or the number of repetitions. For them. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, and I just realized uh, that I didn't give out the number for Piazza. Uh, so 16. Can I just see the code again? Yeah. Um, it's basically exactly the same code as the one before. Except the method we're calling uh, does uh, allow us for replacement. Okay, so in other words, I may get the same exact one over and over and over again. Okay, they may know why that might be. Like, why do we want to do with replacement versus the other model where we're going to do it without replacement? Now, obviously, there's the technical answer of because we're going to we potentially get the same rows more than once. But there's a kind of a, a statistics type answer too. Any ideas? All right, so because in our initial population, when we pull a sample, we want a result that has the same distribution as the original population. All right, whereas in this case, because we have less confidence in the, the data set, in the sample, we actually want to kind of break the distribution a little bit. So that's why we allow replacement so that part of our randomness is actually changing the distribution around so that we can kind of move it a little bit further away from the original sample. Does that make sense? Can you go back to the start of the code? I can't hear you. Can you go back to the start of the code at the beginning? Of this block? Yeah, of the bootstrap section. Yeah. So it's kind of an important distinction, right? So what we want to do is like we want to control our variables when we're trying to do our analysis, right? In the first case, where we have a pretty good idea of the population, we can control one of the variables, which is like we're going to repeat the same distribution or nearly repeat, right? Whereas in the other one, we actually want to introduce a little bit more very variety in our result by uh, allowing for replacement so that it can kind of move around the map a little bit more. Uh, one of the ways that somebody explained this kind of thing to me in the past is that, you know, imagine like a tabletop, right? And you have like depressions on the tabletop and one of the depressions is deeper than all the rest, okay? And you have a ball and you want to find the deepest one. But the problem is you can get the ball stuck. If you roll the ball across the table, right? You can get the ball stuck in one of the littler ones with, and not make it to the bigger one. So what you have to do is kind of introduce a way for the ball to get out of the littler ones and keep yeah. looking, okay? So that's why you sometimes want to introduce, sometimes it's called jitter, sometimes it's called noise, variability, 
uh, basically you want to introduce some noise into the stereo so that your ball doesn't get stuck in the littlest hole and instead of finding the biggest hole. Does that make sense? But when we have one where we know there's only a big hole, like the big, you know, big data set, then we can kind of look for it faster. I don't know. Maybe the example helps. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Help me when I heard it. All right, moving on. Okay, so once we do that, now what we want to know is kind of like, all right, so we did this sampling technique. What we now want to know is like, how good was it? Okay, how good a job did you do? Um, or actually, it's kind of a little bit, it's a little more subtle than that. We're not actually trying to say how good a job we did. We're trying to say, okay, here's our data. Here's our, you know, our median that we found. This is the confidence that you can have in it, okay? So, which is slightly different, right? So, obviously, I know what I did, but what I want to be able to do is report to others, here's the median, and here's the confidence you can have that that's, that that's in the right neighborhood, okay? So, and I talked about this a couple times. Um, so, let's say we're, we want to find, wait, I don't know where the slide from. Yes, I do. Yeah, sorry. I didn't put the slide thing in that one. Um, so let's explain it first. So confidence interval. Has anybody ever heard this term before? And do you know what it means? You think? Here's, here's my example. Okay, go ahead. The 95% confidence interval is like, I'm 95% confident that the mean is within this interval. I know. So it's actually level, but hold on. So here we have my Funko toy. Uh, in my old office, I had them all set up around the office. I still haven't fixed my new office yet, whatever. Um, so what do you notice about the height? If I'm trying to measure the height of this toy. Okay, you notice anything? That's a problem about this uh, rule. Doesn't have enough tick marks, right? So uh, you know, let's let's just pretend this is actually like millimeters, right? So we get to switch, you know, uh, formats very easily. So the problem is, is that the height of this is actually seven point seven whatever these are. Okay, uh, obviously it's a drawn ruler that has no bearing on the real world, but let's say it's 7.7. So our confidence interval is actually 7.5 to 8, right? Because we, we can't say with confidence like that it, it's 7.7, .7, right? I, I'm saying that to kind of illustrate the example. All we know is it's somewhere in here that we don't have enough tick marks, right? So this is our confidence interval. Is how like how wrong am I? Okay, because how how many tick marks can I get in? There? So that's the confidence interval. Sorry, I forgot I had another slide. Um, and so this is what we talk. This is kind of the more formal version of it. What we're trying to do is say, okay, when we want to estimate our parameter, the interval is like the window in which we think the parameter is. Okay, so the parameter, the parameter itself is fixed, it's known, it's true, okay? That 7.7 .7 is true. We just don't have any way of actually saying that 7.7 .7 is, is the right number, right? All we know is that it's somewhere between seven and a half and eight, okay? So what we call that is that estimate. So our estimate is landing in that seven and a half to eight, okay? And then basically if, if the, if the window is small okay that means we're, we're closer to the real answer so if, if it's 7.5 to 8 versus i could have had let's say it was an inch ruler right and my window could have been 7 to 8 right that would be my confidence interval and so that's that's yuckier right so the bigger the wider it is right the less good your estimate is um and then the narrower the better so that kind of brings in that confidence level okay which is that we have a second kind of piece of data there, which is that we're doing these random samples, right? So we are 95% confident that if you take a sample, you will land in the confidence interval, okay? 
So we don't even know that you will actually land between seven and a half and eight every time you take a sample. But we do know that 95% of the time you will. That make sense? So this is why there's like, it's like layers of indirection to the answer here is that the number we give you is somewhere in the window 95% of the time. Okay. And so I think this is the next slide. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, kind of that last bullet is the important bit is that the confidence is in the process that gives the interval. So the process generates a good result. One in the interval, like somewhere in that interval, 95% of the time. So if you look at it here, um, so each horizontal line here is kind of one of those samples, okay? And the red line is the, the like the answer, okay, or is the, the correct parameter. But if you notice, sometimes we get a blue line, okay? And a blue line is one that isn't in the interval. Okay, so we did a sample and it missed. Okay, and what we're saying is that if you do a sample, right, yeah. 95% of the time, you will not have a blue line. Okay, you will have a yellow line. It will cross, it will be in the interval. All right, any questions? Make sense? All right, so here's kind of a real world example. Um, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, apparently is, a, I may be misremembering, but the Pfizer one is the one that pretty people got, right? Um, but the Pfizer vaccine, when they report it, this is how they report its quality, okay? So the vaccine efficacy estimate is 95%. The confidence level is 95% and we by that CL, okay? And then the confidence interval is 90 to 97, okay? So what does that mean? Well, so what it's saying is they're 95% sure that the median of people who get the vaccine are asymptomatic will fall between 90 and 97, okay? So in other words, there's like lots of layers in your direction here, right? Which is that if somebody gets the vaccine and you take a bunch of people who get the vaccine, let's say this whole class gets this vaccine, that they're 95% sure that the median of those people will um, uh, be asymptomatic 90 to 97% of the time, okay? Does that make sense? But that's why, that's why we have all these like pieces of information around our estimates to say, okay, it's gonna be 95% effective for um, uh, basically 90 to 97% of people 95% of the time. And people wonder why they don't entirely understand when statements like this are issued. All right. So the ways we can narrow that confidence uh, interval is we can lower the confidence level. So we can say, you know what? 90%, okay? With only 90% will it fall in the interval. Okay, so that'll make it easier to get in there, but there'll be less likely to happen, right? So that goes back to our seven to eight, right, inches. Um, it's a step to eight instead of whatever, seven and a half to eight. Um, so seven to eight. Now we've, we've made the interval wider, but by basically making the, or sorry, we're lowering the confidence level. So we're actually saying, okay, we're taking 75 to uh, eight, 7.5 to eight, but we're only going to get in there 90% of the time. It's the other one where we can increase the sample size. So that means we, we just run it a bunch more times. So I did it a thousand times in my last example. Let's do it 10,000 times. We can probably get it tighter. Okay, we can make the interval smaller, we can make the level higher, etc. All right, so this is where uh you, you get some active participation. You can wake up, you can just like how this blazes in here. Um so uh and read these very carefully because they are especially the next one is tricky. Um so by our calculation, approximate 95% confidence level for the average age of mothers in the population has a confidence interval of 26.9 to 27.6 years. Um, yeah, so the so basically we're trying to figure out their age, right? And so we're saying that 95% confidence level that the confidence interval is 26.9 to 27.6. 
So is it true that about 95% of the mothers in the population were between 26.9 years and 27.6 years old? So raise your, what did I say here? Raise your right hand if you think it's true, raise your left hand if you think it's false. And unfortunately, we cannot move on until I see the vast majority of hands. All right, so miss with my hands. All right, all right, remember the right and left. All right, so the answer is false. So we don't actually know what the ages of the people are, but we know what their average is, right? So the whole population could be, I don't know, I have some math, right? But, you know, it could be, I don't know, you know, 40 to 150, right? Every single person could be 40 or 150, right? And we might, oh, what are we Oh, sorry, the average is like 30. So lower than that, but 10 and 60, 10 and 50. Uh, every single person in the study could have been 10 years old or 50 years old, and our average was still land in there, right? So we don't actually know how old they are. All we know is that their average age is in that window. Okay. So the reason I'm pulling this, you know, crap basically is because like it's really this is really important to how we talk about this data. Okay, so here's another one. This one, I guess the last one was trickier than I realized. Um, so it's kind of the same scenario, okay, except the, the question is slightly different. There's a 95% probability that the average age of mothers in the population is in the range 26.9 to 27.6. Uh, so raise your right hand if it's true, raise your left hand if it's false. All right, we're still missing like a third of people. So come on, hands. All right. So this one is also false. The average age of the mothers in the population is unknown, but it's a constant. It's not random. Okay, so this is what I was pointing out earlier is that this one is kind of tricky because the like the word choice, right? Which is that it says the average age of the mothers in the population is is right the population is in the range blah 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 right so in other words it's not an estimate it's literally the age which we know is fixed and not random that's what the parameter was on the earlier slide that we talked about um and so we need to make a distinction between whether we're talking about an estimate or we're talking about the actual parameter All right one more and then that's it all right, there is a 95% probability that if you take a new sample, the average age of mothers in the sample is in the range of 26.9 to 27.6. Do you think that's true or false? And this is not the point at which you should say, well, I think it's this one, so I'm going to choose the other. All right, come on, kids. All right, so this one is true. This is the entire point. This is what we're doing, right? Which is that if we do another sample, we have 95% confidence that it will fall in that interval, okay? So if you imagine my, my you know, yellow and blue lines, right? If I get one more line, is it gonna be blue or is it gonna be yellow, okay? And we're 95% we, of the time it's gonna be yellow. All right, so uh, like with most of these things, there are caveats. So you should not use a bootstrap if the estimate is very high or very low percentiles, okay, or minimum max. So in other words, because there's not a lot of like range, bootstrap's probably dangerous, okay? So like if you went out and you did samples of salaries, right, and everybody came back with 50K to 55K, okay? Probably not a good choice for samples if you think the general population is more like, excuse me, is more like 20K to 150K, right? So that it means your sample's not great, and trying to bootstrap off of that is actually probably going to exacerbate how long you are, okay? Um, and then, oh, yeah, and so, and then if you have another one that's a uh, parameter that's greatly affected by rare elements of the population, um, so basically, if, if your outliers have a really bad, a big impact, 
on whatever it is you're working on. Bootstrap is also not going to work real well. Again, because the way Bootstrap works, right, it's pulling samples out of your sample. And so if you have, let's say, you know, you have 100 samples, but you have, I don't know, 40 of them are outliers, okay? Then you pulling that sample is not really going to properly represent the outline. Um, if the probability distribution is specific, it's not roughly double cubed. And we're going to talk about this more later. Um, the shape of the empirical distribution will be occluded. So, in other words, if you kind of draw up that histogram and it doesn't kind of look like a bell, and we're going to talk about um, the bell shape a lot more, um, then it bootstraps also probably not a great idea. So, in other words, if it looks really skewed. Um, it actually is semi reflective of a prior point, it means there's kind of weird outliers and stuff. Um, and then the original sample is very small, so if the if the if the suit if the sample itself is really tiny, it's, it's probably also not going to work very well. Um, it needs to be kind of bigger than it might be for other kinds of scenarios. Um, we'll also talk towards the end of the semester about uh, what is small, um, because that's a difficult answer as well. All right. Um, so there was a no, no more no more demo line. Um, so here it is kind of in practice. Um, I was going back and forth about how to do these, uh, whether I should do slides first or the or the notebook first. Um, so the first thing we need to do is we want to know, okay, so where where is that window, right? So um Say oops, unions from when we were doing stuff before. Um, and so okay, so what we're doing here, right, is we're saying we want 95%, right? But we want that five percent on both ends. Okay, so we have to do two and a half and two and a half. So that's what we're doing here uh, to be able to get the, the window. We don't like we don't want the window all on one side, right? We want it on both sides. So it should give us a history. Um, and dots aren't great. Um, and so this is kind of showing us where do those medians come out. Okay, and let's see if I can. Word. Yeah. So my uh, my coloring isn't working quite right. Uh, so, but imagine, right? So basically, we have that kind of window on either end, um, and it's hard. It's hard to talk about without being show it. Uh, let me see if I can find a better. Nope. Let me see if I can make this work better. Yeah, it's not going to show it right. But basically, the point is like we we want to know how how we're doing for our interval, um, and so that's what I was trying to show here. But apparently, it's not working. Uh, the problem with doing a lot of these examples in class. Is it's every time I call sample, right? I'm getting different data, so I don't always know what I'll end up with. So this one didn't work. Um, but long story short, uh, you know, so so what we're trying to do is figure out what that confidence interval is, so that we, when we do our sampling and that it's in the median, um, you know, we pull that median out. How like what's our confidence of that we're in that interval, and then how likely it is that we'll be able to do it again. Um, I suspected that I had not enough content for today's lecture. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit. Yeah. So we'll talk about Trivish a little bit and then finish it next time.
Right. We'll ignore that because I haven't fixed this uh, set of slides up yet. Okay. Uh, let's actually go back a second. Okay. <laughs> Chevrotev? I don't know. I can never say his name right. Um, so, this is Chevrotev inequality. Um, and so, what this is really, this is really, I think, very cool. Um, and so, no matter what the shape of the distribution, the bulk of the data are in the range of the mean plus or minus a few what are called standard deviations. And we're going to talk about what all those words mean as we go along. Um, and it proves this statement, no matter what the distribution, the proportion of values in the range of mean plus or minus Z standard deviations is at least one minus one divided by Z squared. Okay, so that's great and a bunch of math. Um, so we'll go to an example. So if we have a mean of 10, okay, so an average of 10, and a standard deviation of size three, then at least um, yes. Uh, oh, I had to. so I thought I thought we'd done this slide and then it was out of order. So basically, what it says is that if we have any distribution, we can estimate where that average will be. And it'll be within one or two standard deviations. Let me just see if there's a better slide about standard deviations. Yeah, this one. So we have test grades, right? So we have a midterm and we have a final, and we have two kind of weird distributions, right? So they're not particularly normal distributions, and these are not, um, it doesn't really matter what they are, but the point is that. We don't necessarily expect an exam to be evenly distributed, right? We may have an exam that everybody does really well, right? Or an exam that everybody does really bad, or one that is evenly distributed, but it, it can be really varied. So we don't necessarily want or know what that distribution is going to look like. Um, and so, and also that the numbers are wildly different. So, uh, for example, the midterm. You all just did without a 77 points. And the let's say the final was out of 90 points, because these aren't necessarily percentages, right? They're just the number of points of the exam. So if we want to compare those two things, we need to turn them into standard units. Okay. And this is a kind of a specific mechanism to shift all of the data into kind of the same space. So instead of being, you know, whatever it was out of 77 or out of 90. We're instead, we're going to shift it all to be right around zero, but we're going to shift it all evenly so that the relationships are the same. So now, because we don't, at the end of the day, especially when we're comparing some of these things to each other, we often don't care what the actual data is, right? What we care about is like, what's the difference between the distribution of the midterm and the distribution of the final? Right? So in, other words, in that way, we can actually shift that data to be around zero, and now we can compare apples to apples, right? It is before we couldn't compare those two histograms because the numbers were so wildly different. So we can use the technique of changing them into standard units, which then allows you to get into standard deviations. But I think maybe we'll kind of stop there because uh, these slides are mildly broken because I think I had slides when you go through before these that I caught last night. Um, and as you might imagine, I have like a thousand slides and I basically put them in based on where the topics. Uh, so we'll talk about more standard deviations and standard units next time. Um, but suffice to say, standard units, it's really, really important because they allow you to compare apples to apples. Uh, and then we'll get into how we do it next time. <laughs>